Hi there, my name is Martin Riley. I'm a positive behaviour support practitioner with the National Autistic Society in Scotland. Um, today, I'm just going to do a brief talk around about what positive behaviour support is and its role in, in supporting and challenging behaviour, ways to manage behaviour both in the short term and the long term, and hopefully provide some kind of advice and, and tips that you might find useful um, for your own situations. So, yeah, I'll just track on because I'm currently filming this whilst my son is having a nap, so fingers crossed I can get it to finish before he wakes up. We'll see how we go. So, what is positive behaviour support? So, basically, the core aim of PBS is the prevention and reduction of challenging behaviour, and it focuses on improving the quality of life of the person and those around them. So, it works on developing and building skills of the person and of those that support them rather than using aversive or restrictive interventions. So it's very much a proactive approach to support and challenging behaviour, not just waiting until something happens and then trying to firefight or trying to you know, manage um, those situations you know, off the cuff. It's trying to provide a kind of structure around about the behaviour and framing that in the context of someone's life, what the, what the behaviour means to that person, what the function is, what the message is. And looking at those kind of long term strategies as well, um, that hopefully will reduce behaviour over time and also improve that person's quality of life. So that's the kind of key concept around about was the behaviour support. So I'm assuming you know we all know causes of challenging behaviour and increased anxiety, what that looks like, and they'll all be specific to um every individual. So I'm just kind of listing some kind of common ones that I came across and, and people that I work with come across as well um, in terms of what, what, what kind of things can cause challenging behaviour. So the first thing really to touch on is, is health. Um, it's something at times that can be overlooked as a root cause of the behaviour and it's always really important to kind of check that out first. Um, because if someone's unwell or in pain or ill, um, or you know, there's, there's something health wise just not right, then that's the first thing that you really need to look at because if that's the cause of the, the behaviour, then obviously that's that's what needs to be um, remedied. And it's always really important to look at that first before moving on to other causes. Um, so it's, it's always what we look at first, and you know, it's always something to rule out, um, and it's better to be on the safe side in that respect. Other kind of main causes that we can come across in terms of challenging behaviour, communication difficulties, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with. So that can um, encompass quite a lot of, of different issues. So how people communicate, is communication understood? Can people communicate effectively? Do they have a method of communicating? Do they understand how instructions in terms of how they are passed back? To, to them, or can interpret them as a processing thing to understand information. So, again, a wide range of issues surrounding communication, um, but one that we come across you know, quite regularly as, as one of the kind of causes of, of um, challenging behaviour. Another kind of main issues or key factors is the environment. So, what is the environment like for, for someone? Is it a, a suitable environment? Is it giving the person what they need? Is the person feel comfortable in that environment? Um, and that can be the physical environment. So is it too hot? Is it too cold? Is it too bright? Is there too many people? Um, and also those kind of interpersonal relationships within an environment. You know, who people are, how, how that interaction happens. Um, is it predictable? Is it inconsistent? Um, do people know what was expected of them in different environments? Can they transfer skills? All those kind of things. So again, um, unique to, to each individual and a, a big factor in, you know, if you can get the environment right for someone, it can go a long way to help, you know, reducing some um, instances of behaviour. And other kind of things that we tend to come across. So change, which is difficult for everyone. Um, unfamiliar experiences, if you're, if you're doing something new and you're not sure what's expected of you, what you need to do. Um, and, and planning and preparation, if you're just falling into something before you've had the chance to plan or, or, or know what you expect to do or prepare for it. So, as I say, you'll be, you, I'm sure you'll be familiar with lots of different causes of the challenge behavior. These are just a few um, of the common ones we come across and maybe 
if there's something in there that you, you notice or you think, well, that, that's, um, that looks familiar or that might be a cause, it's a good starting point to start to unpick why the behaviour's happening. Um, so, moving on from that, if you can kind of start to identify why that behaviour is occurring, um, it's then trying to figure out what the function of the behaviour is for, you know, the, the person, um, it's understanding what you need that's meeting. So, again, I'm sure some of you will be familiar with this, but just as a, as a quick kind of overview, you tend to work within four functions of behaviour and those four functions are sensory, escape, attention, and tangible. So basically the behaviour happens for one of these reasons. Um, it could be a sensory-based behaviour because it makes the person feel good or it takes away bad feelings from them. It could be an escape function, which is basically trying to avoid something you don't want to do or, or avoid an environment you don't want to be in um, or, or avoid something you don't understand or you're not sure of what was expected of you. Attention is like to gain social attention, social interaction from other people. Um, and, and what you tend to find is at times if, if someone has not got a lot of attention, it doesn't necessarily matter if initially that attention is positive or negative, as long as they're getting some form of attention and behaviour is a very good way of, of getting attention if you start off, because people tend not to be able to ignore the more challenging behaviours, so you're going to get attention regardless of what, what type of attention that is. Um, intangible, which is basically the behaviour happens in order to gain something you want. So I know if I do this, you're going to give me um, what I want um, through that behaviour. So again, just as a standpoint, something to think about if any of these seem familiar to you or you, um, you think of that, that may be um, specific to someone um, that you know, your child, whoever, um, that may be that that's a kind of starting point for identifying why the behaviour is happening. And then what we kind of try and tend to do is make that a bit more specific and personal to the individual. So what's the message behind that? What are they actually trying to tell you? Um, please spend time with me. Please don't say no. I don't understand what I'm meant to do. I don't feel good. I'm in pain. I like doing this. I like the way this feels. I want something. Trying to personalise the function to an individual because they're, although people will have the same functions of behaviour, the actual message within those is going to be different for every person. And if you can try and figure out the message of what someone's trying to tell you, it does go a long way to making the behaviour make sense, not only to you, but to, to, to that person as well. And then you can start to pick out specific strategies that will work for that specific message. So there may be different behaviours that you're, you're dealing with or different situations that are challenging and they may all have different messages and it's not to say that you're going to necessarily be able to pick those out straight away because some may be more um, difficult to identify than others but if there's a few that you think actually I know what they're, what they're, you know, they're trying to tell me here then it's, it's a good starting point in terms of then thinking about what can I do with that message, how do I manage that, how do I support um, at that person through those times. So that's just a kind of wee quick overview of um, identifying causes of behaviour, what the function of behaviour is, and can you identify a message from that, that function. So when then we look at using positive behaviour support, um, these are some of the key considerations to think about. So anything that you do is obviously going to be individual to that person. There's no point in taking that a one-size-fits-all approach because we're all different. We all behave differently in different situations and we all have a different need at those times. So uh, the, the key is it needs to be individual, it needs to be focused on what uh, what does that person need uh, at any given time. Again, focusing on the quality of life, so how do you enhance someone's quality of life? We know that if you have a, a good quality of life, if you have things within your life that you want, things within your life, need if you're ready, ready access to those things if you're in charge of when things happen, when things don't happen, you've got choice and control within your life, you're, you're listened to, you're, you're respected, um, you're surrounded by people that you like, you're surrounded um, and you get to enjoy interactions that you want to be part of. That goes a long, long way to reducing difficult behaviour and anxiety because you're not having to work hard to get things that you want. 
Um, the harder you have to work for things that you own or things that are, are restricted from you, obviously the more extreme the behaviour can become because you're not really available. So again, thinking about is there things in someone's life that perhaps they're not having access to readily or that there's something they're not a part of that you really want to be and would that go some ways to reducing some of the behaviours that we might be seeing? So again, a very proactive kind of way of, of, of looking at behaviour and not just looking at behaviour in isolation, but looking at it in terms of someone's quality of life. Some other things um, to think about is um, enhancing motivation. So recognising and playing people's strengths. If people are motivated to do things that they're motivated to do things specifically that they enjoy, they're more likely to engage. You know, if there's something you really like to do and you have more access to that as a way of coping with things and also as a way of building skills, you're more likely to engage in that on a more regular basis. But so it's thinking about what, what motivates someone, someone, you know, like a child or a family member or whoever it may be, what motivates them and what can you use that motivation to build skills, to allow someone to communicate, communicate effectively um, to you at different times. Because we all have things that we like, we all have things that motivate us more than others. And if you can find something that you know, gets someone's interest and, and, and really starts them on a path to engage more readily and more regularly, it opens doors to actually then trying to put in other things that maybe not be as motivating. But if someone's got the chance to engage and participate and enjoy what they're doing, it's a good starting point. If you can find, find something that's motivating for that person, it's, it's something to start with. Um, building capable environment. So again, thinking about environment, what's right in the environment, what's wrong in the environment. If there's things that are wrong, are wrong in the environment, then what can we try and do to remedy that? Um, and we'll look at some, um, some examples in the next in a few slides. But that's the kind of key considerations in terms of looking at positive behavior support. So an overall kind of a longer term approach and a proactive approach focusing on quality of life um, is what we're looking at. So some more practical tips. So we're looking to look at a few tips around about communication as you know it's a key issue for um, people who display challenge of behavior. You know, all behavior is a, form, is a form of communication and challenge of behavior is no different. It's, it's, it's trying to tell you something and some of the things to look at um, in the next few slides and that if there's a say if there's any you think are useful then absolutely um, feel free to use them. So obvious things such as using clear and specific language. So getting someone's attention first. Does the person know that you are talking to them, that you're addressing them, that you're beginning an interaction with them? Um, it can be easy sometimes to forget, especially if you're dealing with a lot of things or there's a lot of people in the room to just assume someone's listening to what they're saying, but it's always good to try and get someone's attention first, using their name, um, making sure that they're, they're intelligent the first they're looking at you, whatever that may be, but getting someone's attention. Processing time, allowing people to process information. Processing time fluctuates depending on anxiety. You know, if people are happy and calm and enjoying themselves and if it's whatever you tell them is on their agenda, then processing time can be a lot quicker. If someone's quite anxious or upset or distracted, it can take longer to process what, what they've been asked or what they've been told. So one of the general rules, looking at kind of the six second rules, so thinking about can you give someone that amount of time to process what you've said before giving them another instruction or another prompt or another um, piece of information, whatever that may be. It's just trying to slow down the communication to allow someone to process depending on their mood. And as I say, you know people you know, you know, the child, family member, whoever, and what that is and what that looks like in different situations, but it's just something to kind of think about in terms of, of what processing time is for, for a, a specific individual. Um, being a specific one instruction at a time, the exact language, using fewer words. Um, again, it can be easy to start putting a lot of verbal communication in, especially when you're stressed or when that person's stressed and you, you want something to happen. So we tend to talk a lot quicker, we tend to say a lot of things and then all these things for us because there's so much going on at that point that the key thing you're trying to get across, the key piece of information you're trying to get across gets lost because it's surrounded by all this other 
information that's been given. So try to pick the key words that you want to tell someone or you want someone to know, and then being consistent with those phrases, using the key words, and then allowing the process and time to repeat that if needed. So, you know, just thinking about what are the key things I need to tell someone in this, in this situation, and allowing that time for the person to understand that. Some other kind of general tips around about communication, so um, given available choices, sometimes it can be hard for people to choose. Um, if it's open-ended, what would you like to do? And you might just get a stop response and a learned response, um, and that might not necessarily be what that person wants to do at that time. So it's, you know, it can be good sometimes to just give available choices and make those quite concrete. You know, it may be through using visuals, it may be through using the actual objects themselves, using pictures whatever that may be, but if you're giving someone a concrete choice, um, it's easier for someone to process that information and make an informed choice about um, what they actually want to do rather than just giving a stop response um, to a question. So some other kind of things around here, so visual supports, we're going to look at some examples of that um, that we've used in the past and um, yeah, using positive language, so, which can be hard. Uh, and especially if you're stressed and um, you know there's, there's so much going on and you know you need to get a point of it can be it can be very hard to stay positive all the time and, and I don't think anyone expects that to, to be the case at all times but it's just thinking about that positive language and how that can build self-esteem in people and how also uh, you know it gives the, the relationships that it can form in terms of trust and in terms of predictability and, and also just those positive relationships that we can form through the use of positive language. Um, and, and that can be different again for each individual, but if there's particular phases that people gravitate towards or, or, or seem to like, then th those are ones just maybe to note down and think, well, that worked that time, you know, when I gave, when I gave praise or I said this in this way or I said this particular word, you know, that was really effective. So again, thinking, is there something that actually you can use in terms of positive language that, that you can put in on a consistent basis. And again, just remember that ability to communicate will deteriorate under stress, and then that can be different again for, for each person. And just allowing people that actually that process and time if that is the case. So we use a lot of social stories, um, and they're very effective in getting information across. Um, so there's an example here which um, you can have a read at and again social stories are going to be different for each person, they can be constructed um, to allow the information you want to get across to that person um, to be written in a way that is going to get the information across effectively. So again, it's not a one size fits all type of, of um, story. They're going to be unique to each individual, but they are very, very useful. We, we, we use them um, extremely regularly and they're extremely useful ways of communicating information to people um, because you can obviously, they're predictable, they're consistent, they can be read as many times as they need to be. Um, so again, it's something you're familiar with. Um, that's great. If not, that be something to, to look into in terms of um, using that as a, as, a, as a strategy. So the next thing we're going to look at is structure and why that's important um, in the long term. And the structure obviously enables people to predict events and understand their environment and um, allows support difficulties in organising a variety of everyday more complex tasks. And if you use visual communications to support this structure, um, play into the visual strengths of an individual. So, Thinking about what structure looks like for a particular person and how can you put that in consistently. So again, do some kind of um, general kind of advice strategies around about that. So structuring an activity, structuring someone's day, week, or month, or structuring the environment. Some kind of key questions to think about around about those. So structuring the activity. So what's happening? Where is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? How is it going to happen? Um, again, just not assuming that people know exactly what they're supposed to do um, in any given situation and thinking again about transferable skills. You know, just because someone can do something in one setting doesn't necessarily mean that that skill will be transferred to another setting. Um, 
you know, if you can make a cup of tea and you don't pitch in, it's a very easy thing to do. And it's, you learn it really easy and it becomes, you know, second nature because you know where everything is, you know where your kettle is, where your cups are, where your tea's kept. But if you go to someone else's house and they actually make a cup of tea, you're not as quick to do it because things are different. You need to take time to figure out where things are, where things are kept, you know, um, all those kind of things. So again, thinking about structure in terms of does, does you know, your child, does um, the person you're working with, the person support, do they know what is expected? Um, so again, just a very kind of quick way of doing it, but what's going to happen, where's it going to happen, when, how, and then what next? So what happens after that, if it's finished, that task finished, what's happened after that? Because again, that can be a, a, a difficult um, concept for people to understand that this is finished, so what's happening next? And if that information is not there, then you can tend to find that people can struggle there in um, those kind of transitions. So I just, as I say, I'm sure a lot of you will familiar with this anyway, but if there's a few things there, you can just be useful then absolutely um, use it as, as you require. So some other things around the structure. So schedules and programs, which clearly depict what will happen and when, where you can get materials. So if you're doing something that actually requires you to have um, materials available to complete what you're doing, how do you get access to them? Who's going to be helping? Who's going to be participating? Is it a group activity? Is it a, uh, an activity you're doing on your own? How long is it going to last? What happens next? Um, trying to program change into schedules which isn't always easy because unexpected change happens to us all and that's one of the most difficult things to cope with. But if we know things are going to change, then it's just trying to be as proactive as possible in telling someone about a change. That's where social stories can be really useful if you know um, that there's a change to be happen soon and you think someone's going to struggle with that. Getting information across to that person um, in a timeless fashion and allowing that thing to process and also then knowing what's going to happen because there's been a change so we can't do this but i'm going to do this instead um, and also if something's stopped for whatever reason when's it going to start again is it going to start again again it's good um, so sure is a good way of like, getting those bits of information across to people um, and again just presenting that structure visually um, as well so you don't always have to rely on the communication because it can become quite draining if you're always having to say the same thing over and over and over and over for you and for, for the person. So it's thinking about, is it an easier way to do that? Can we just represent that visually and then we don't have to have the same conversation all the time. We can just, you know, there's something that's concrete, that's consistent and can be, um, you know, used as opposed to using verbal communication all the time. So, just some examples. Um, again, I'm sure some of you, some of you have seen these before, but some examples of visually representing what's meant to happen. So first, then, so first we get dressed, then we go to the campaign. Um, a menu planner for dinner. So this is what we're going to have for dinner. Um, and again, that can be made specific to um, each individual and then some choice boards. So again, rather than we're talking about don't give people open any choices because it can be quite difficult sometimes to decide what you want to do. There's an example of here's the choices that are available at this moment, what would you like to do? Now you might not have as many choices that you might think that that's the far too many. You can reduce that and make it specific to what you need at that point. But again, a good way of, of having something there that can be consistently used. Um, and there's a huge variety of different ways to represent um, what's meant to be happening and structure within someone's day. Symbol strips, visual planners, um, iPads now have all the different apps that can plan someone's day for them as well. There's, there's various different ways of visually representing that, but again, just a few examples. Um, and taking it is, is what you need to you know. Someone may only need to cope with first then, rather than a full day. Um, and if that works for you, then, and then that's what works for you, and that, that's what you would use. Some people may be able to cope with a full day plan visually represented. So it's just knowing what works, what's going to work for you in, in these kind of situations. Um, again, just another um, look at planning activities and how do people know what's going to be happening. So 
15 minutes at the time to start and yellow means get ready to stop, red means it's time to stop. So it becomes predictable. I know when I see these colours, what's meant to happen. So I'm starting this, it's about the end, and it's ended, and then what's happening next. So as I say, loads of different ways of representing um, structure visually. Just a few examples, and if you have your own network for your own day, if there's things here that you see that you, you like, then um, absolutely you can use. Another example, just the instruction of feed time. So again, thinking about how much feed time does someone have? Do they have someone to play with? Yes or no? Where can you play inside or outside? What can you play um, outside or inside? And those choices within those um, different criteria. So again, you, you can have that amount of information on that. You can reduce that amount of information. You can more information. Again, it just brings a bit of predictability, a bit of structure to the time um, and, and bits of the day that might be more difficult than others because there's not something actually happening at that time and you know the child's on the spot and doesn't know what to do, how to self-occupy, how to do things without um, being supported so is it a way of, of trying to structure that so that, that, that you know you're given opportunities within that to time to do something constructive. Um, so just kind of moving on to obviously people being anxious, being upset, um, all those feelings and emotions that precede, you know, displays of uh, behaviour. How can you try and work through that so that people are able to start identifying when they're feeling upset, when they're feeling angry, um, when they're feeling sad, and how can you how can that be communicated? Um, I looked at a couple of other videos on the site and I noticed that it was um, some of the videos contained by the incredible five point scale, which is a really useful tool um, and can be used in a variety of different ways, but just really something really visual and really easy and really quick, especially if someone's feeling anxious, feeling sad, feeling stressed, feeling angry, you know, it's very hard to articulate feelings at that point. You want something really easy so that someone can point to it and show you whatever and you know, um, right, okay. That it number four in the scale, and that's you know they're really stressed and do this at this point, or that it number one, right? Okay, so I can be a bit more proactive um, and you know work on, on, on different skills at that point. But again, something that someone can just look at, identify where they are, and then you know what you do at that point. And it's, it's great to get people, I mean, you do a lot, a lot of people in terms of designing their own five point scales, their own uh, feeling and emotions charts. Because if it's specific to you and you know better than me or someone else how you feel, then that's going to be the most accurate information you're going to get. So someone can be part of that process of identifying where they, um, how they feel and where they're going to be at any particular point. And that's it's, it's a really useful um, way of getting that information from someone. And as I say, there's loads of different examples. That's just, um, as I say, one scale. Um, and Another example of a five point scale round about um, voice volume. So again, it can be um, it can be visual in terms of just pictures, they can have writing on them, it can be um, you know, whatever is going to work for that person. It can be symbols, it can be pictures, it can be photographs, it can be writing. But again, the, the key thing is can you identify what that feeling, what that emotion is? Is it easy for that person to tell you? How they're feeling and what do you do with that information? Um, and one of the other kind of key elements of point paper support is skill teaching. So, a variety of different skills which you can teach, which obviously I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. So communication skills, which we'll talk obviously a lot about. Um, so, communication skills in terms of teaching um, a communication skill to replace the function of behavior. So, if you look at escape, for example, um, can you give someone a way of communicating that they don't know what they're doing or they want to take a break or they want to stop or you know just in five minutes um to themselves and using that as a way of telling you without resorting to you know challenging the way that a, a, a behavioral means to do it um, something as simple as a break card a stop card um, a sign a particular phrase whatever that may be is really useful um, and, and really obviously 
bad prep of only someone using the video to tell you what to stop. Um, and just general skills, so self help skills, we talk about improving quality of life has been a, a key factor in PBS. So, increasing people's independence, increasing independence in terms of you know, self help skills, in terms of you know, things that people want, like to do and want to learn. So, just general skills of the person teeth getting dressed, and then making a meal, making a cup of tea, you know, being independent in terms of washing, drying, whatever that may be. And also, fun skills, you know, introducing skills in a fun way, baking. Excuse me, baking um, you know, arts and crafts, different things like that. It's really it's a good way of not only teaching a skill but boosting people's self esteem. Feeling that you've achieved something on your own, uh, you know, without help or with less help than you have before, is a really, really satisfying feeling. Um, and showing that there is it's worth engaging in skills because there's a sense of satisfaction and that you're doing something from that. And then coping skills. So, Relaxation techniques, how to ten, you know, all these different things, and, and again, they're, they're only some some um, skills will work better than others, depending on how anxious or upset someone is. But it's always worth bearing in mind: can can you teach self coping skills? Do people can cope with difficult behaviours themselves initially, and are able to calm down? It's, it's a great way of you know what. Providing that resilience to a person understanding that they can manage the behavior the, the as well, not just rely on others. But you have to do it and it's worth investing time in and those kind of coping skills. Um, and again, people will learn in different ways, teaching skills in small steps. You can teach skills one bit at a time, start at the beginning and then you do the rest. You can do the skill all the way through and ask person to do the last bits with forward chain and backward chain. And, um, Dipping in and out, you know, there's certain bits of a skill that someone can do and they work on that and if they, they master that, then they move on to the next bit. Um, and thinking about, as I spoke about earlier on, what motivates people? So if you think there's a particular skill that you're looking to learn and there's something motivating within that, you know, if someone's to learn how to cook about the cake, the motivation is at the end of that, you're getting something you want to eat, if it's a cake, if it's a um, you know, whatever it may be, a slice of toast, whatever, but you're building a skill within that. But there's also a motivator at the end of that, that, that process as well. And looking at the special interests, it's a special interest that your child, someone like the sport, and someone in your family has. And if there is a special interest, they can build skills around about that. Um, and then just finally, in, in some of the general tips around about um, that kind of long term management of, of behaviour. So again, a lot of life stuff, introducing new experiences, fun experiences, open up, you know. Worries to people and, and allowing them to try different things, building confidence and self esteem, um, and things like a one page profile, which will show you an example of a really useful because, again, getting people engaged in their own life, giving them the choice of control, allowing someone to tell you what they like, what they, what they don't like, what works for them, what doesn't work for them, because that, that's the, the crucial information, and no one's going to be in a better place. Deal with that than the person themselves. It's just a way of how you get that information um, from them. So, quick example of uh, a one page profile. So, what's important to me? Playing the game the computer, having a reading in class, watching Doctor Who, people answering my questions, not being ignored. What am I good at doing? I've got a good sense of humour, I've got a good memory for events. Can you use that in terms of skill building, in terms of introducing experiences to people? And what's the best way to support me? So don't look at the instructions because it makes me anxious. When I become anxious, ask me to have a break in a quiet place. Write down the list of things you want me to do with this helps me focus. So again, obviously a general example and I'm going to do simple stuff, but something maybe uh, if you haven't used or uh, you know you think might be um, useful, then absolutely um, give it a go. Because then if you start to Pick out these key things and they're, they're there and they're written down and what happens to points like kind of like what they're doing in this situation, what they're doing in that situation. You know these are the key elements that you want to focus on. It becomes easier to make it more consistent in terms of what you do to support someone um, on, on, in these instances of doing these um, activities and during difficult times as well. Um, so yeah. Uh, don't assume people know what you intend to do and um, always explain what will happen and why. Give 
five advanced warning of the um, any changes or cancellations that's going to really affect someone pay. Never promise anything that can't be guaranteed, which I know is difficult. Um, I certainly find that as well, um, because I think this will get me out of this situation. So I'll just say this can happen, um, even though I don't know if that's the case or not. And that then um, brings the next set of difficulties because they promise something that may not necessarily be able to happen. And as I say, that's not all you can do, especially when you're feeling stressed, but just maybe um, something to think about um, in more kind of longer term um, situations. And again, we talked about coping skills, self harm strategies. If you have self harm strategies, that's brilliant. Um, you want to encourage that. So it's going to be trying not to stop that. And, and it, might, it might be for a variety of different reasons, but it may be a bit strange or you know, for people to understand what's happening at that point. But if that's a strategy that someone uses to calm down um, by themselves, it's, it's great that people have those kind of coping skills. Obviously, it poses a risk. Risks to, to, to them or others, then that's obviously at the stage where you probably need to, to intervene. But if that's not the case, then allowing people that they have self harm strategies to continue using and encourage them to use them. Um, so, structure we spoke about avoiding confrontation, which we're going to just look at in terms of an incident and uh, if an incident of behavior occurs, because what you don't want to try and turn it into is a win lose situation, um, because then you don't actually manage the situation or manage the behaviour or think about what the message behind the behaviour is it becomes I'm right, you're wrong or, or, or vice versa and I'm going to make sure that that's understood and then it becomes a confrontation and the situation comes worse. Um, so thinking about how do we look at it again in the context of what the message behind the behaviour is rather than this is an episode of behaviour that I find difficult and I can't deal with and um, it becomes a confrontation, and as I say, I know that's, that's a difficult thing to, to do, and it takes a lot of practice. Um, but it's just, it's, it's, it's just a kind of starting point from thinking about the behavior as having that uh, message behind it. Um, avoid, the neg avoid the negatives, which we spoke about, and the skill building. And um, again, a, a, good, a good proactive kind of focus of um, increasing that kind of quality of life for someone. So, just lastly, to look at what happens when someone's really upset. Um, as I say, people will probably be familiar with this, I can not. Um, this is just a basic arousal um, cycle for someone when they're feeling anxious or stressed. So, having a variety of different triggers, looking at it, um, stars there at the bottom, which escalate someone's arousal levels up to a point where they're triggering the phase and then into that kind of crisis phase where, you know, that behaviour occurs um, and, and people feel really, really stressed, really anxious um, and it's a really, really difficult time for them. And that, that, for that crisis point, that's obviously when it's very, very difficult to manage. So obviously that, that's a very general kind of um, explanation about that, but it's just to show you that someone you know, will go through that cycle of being calm, being upset, becoming really upset into that crisis phase, and then it can take a while to work through that um, behaviour. And that's the that's the hardest point. If you if, if it's if someone's in that crisis phase, that's a hard point to manage any behaviour. Because at that point there's no rational thinking going on in terms of what's happening for that person. Like I'm not thinking about I'm doing this behaviour deliberately because I want to upset you because I think this and that, that, that that might, you know, at that point there, it's just reacting. You know, the person's reacting to something that's going wrong for them. Um, so that's when that rational thought goes out the window and it becomes very, very hard for that person to calm down and also for that behavior to be managed. So what we were speaking about earlier, that proactive stuff, that, that, that long term, those long term strategies, providing that structure, making sure the environment's right, using the right communication, building skills. That's just, that's the key to it. That's the key to working on not getting to this stage regularly. Um, but if we are in that stage, or you find yourself in that stage, then thinking about um, having a lower level approach. So basically thinking about how do you reduce triggers um, which may arouse an individual that presents a challenging behaviour? Um, 
and what their strategies can be used at these points. So some of the assumptions, obviously, when people are um, particularly upset. So someone's challenging and they're usually extremely aroused at the time. You should therefore avoid doing anything that will arouse the person who's already upset. So not making the situation worse, because if someone's upset, it doesn't take much to make that situation worse. And we've all been in a situation where you've probably been upset yourself and somebody said the wrong thing to you, and that makes you think things worse. Um, and again, thinking about that can, that can be difficult at that time, but just think about it. something that, I, that, that I've noticed that happens when you're upset and that tends to make them even more upset, like trying to kind of limit that in the future or, or, or not see those particular things. Um, assumption two, thinking about um, a large proportion of channels and games are used to proceed by demands and requests. So if we reduce remark, if we reduce the demands and requests, then it might help reduce the frequency and perhaps the intensity of instinct. So if there's something you know that particularly upsets someone, um, then is there a way that we can reduce that demand or not have it used or not, not place that demand on these frequently? Not to say we're not ever expected to ask people to do things, but obviously we all have to do things in life that you know there might be particular times when we just have to let you know let a demand go or a request go because you know that it's going to bring about um, an incident because the person is just not coping that day for whatever reason. Um, and then assumption three, most behaviour, uh, most uh, communication is predominantly non-verbal, therefore we should aware of signals we communicate to people who are upset. So again, people are very visual when they're not going to say that they might not necessarily take in what they're saying, but body language wise, it's, it's easier to identify what they're trying to communicate. So again, thinking about your body language in those kind of situations, what, what you're trying to get across to someone, so you're, the, you're trying to support them through it. What does that look like? How do we know that that's the case? So, I think again, people will pick up on, on, on non verbal cues a lot quicker than they will in verbal uh, communication. So, some of the kind of key things so, as I say, don't make don't go through on fire, you know, don't make a bad situation worse. And uh, as I say, that's not always easy. Um, I hope I understand that. Um, especially We've all been in that situation and best speaking I have countless times where you've said the wrong thing, done the wrong thing, and then you think, oh, well, but it's not beating yourself up about that, it's just understanding, like, right, well, I'm going to do that next time mm -hmm. um, because I know it would be you that caused that. And as I say, I've been there numerous times. Um, can you learn from that? Um, removing or reducing adverse stimuli, so taking away things that are causing someone distress. Um, Basically, if you know there's a particular item or a particular person or a particular environment that's causing this, um, then removing or trying to reduce the person's exposure to that as much as possible. Because what we're trying to do in these situations is making the situation safe as quickly as possible. So getting the person and that situation to a point that is um, they're calm, the situation safe and under control, and, and, and you're calm as well, you're feeling okay, and, and you, you, you need to manage it. So, again, it's, it's having that in mind in terms of what we're we trying to achieve when someone's really upset. It's not about trying to tell someone that they've done something wrong or about um, teaching skills or anything at that point. It's about how can I help you through this difficult situation. And then, once you've got someone to a point where they are calm, then the longer term stuff that we spoke about earlier, then trying to look at right. What was the reason behind that? What can we do to reduce that? And how can we work with that person to help them understand other ways of communicating, other ways of doing things, introducing other things so that this behavior doesn't happen again? So that's what we're trying to do in these situations is support someone through a difficult time and manage it safely. And then we do all the learning in longer term. Um, so uh, yeah, communication adaptation, so again, less verbal, more visual. Um, think about the environment, as the things in the environment that causing stress, can you remove them? And then you motivate us and distract us. Is there something motivating that someone that we can give someone at that point which is going to stop the situation from happening? As I say again, thinking about what they're trying to do in these situations or trying to manage and support someone safely um, through a difficult time, a time that they're having a really difficulty with. And 
if there's something that you know is going to bring that situation to an end safely, are you able to use that? Not to say that that's something that you want to use all the time because then you know, we're in favour and things like that can come but you've got to then think about what is it you're trying to do and how how, how risky is the situation, how severe is the situation, and what have you got at your disposal that you can use to, to stop that from escalating. So, just to finish quickly, um, I think one of the key things as well to remember is that we all challenge behaviour. We all, we all get upset at different times for different reasons, and we all display some form of, of behaviour to show that. Um, so it's not limited to certain people. Um, and again, focusing solely on someone's behaviour is, is quite dangerous because it does lead to that kind of dehumanisation, and you do start to label people with behaviours. You know. They kick, they hit, they spit, they, they, you know, all these kind of things. And, and that language is very dangerous because you stop seeing them as a person, you start seeing them as something that you want to control, you want to fix, you want to change, and you don't look at the quality of life. Um, and it's always putting behaviour into the context of that, what's happened for that person in their life at that moment. What is the reason this behaviour has happened? And all behaviour is affected by our environment, other people, how we feel physically and emotionally, and what's happened to them that day. Again, you know, some days are just not good days, and you know, all of those days, and it's important to remember that. Like some days we feel brilliant and we can cope with things, you know, easily, and other days the same things we just cannot cope with because it's just not a good day. Um, and also, we all still need to friends and personal relationships. To feel good of ourselves, to contribute to work, to feel skilled, to be part of things, um, and to be involved in day to day life. And again, just come back to that as, as, a, as a quality of life, as someone that, regardless of the behaviour and challenge behaviour, people need these things in life, people challenge, the people that have you know, difficult behaviours and are extremely anxious, um, you know, or just find things difficult, maybe even more, um, to, uh, to improve the quality of life. So, thanks for listening. I hope you found it useful. Um, and as I say, if there's anything within that that you think might work or you want to try or anything like that, then absolutely feel free to, um, to use it. Okay, thanks for listening. Take care. Bye.